Um, I am thrilled to be here in my hometown. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought for, for, for the reading tonight, just knowing um, that we've been messing with time a little bit um, in the past week and still getting used to the, the dark coming uh, earlier, and also that tomorrow begins um, hunting season, that I would pick a couple of passages uh, that, uh, that demonstrate kind of the, the view of time that I think um, in working with the book, I uh, and and then working through the editing process, I was struck by various editors and the various people who weighed in on the manuscript. Um, I I started to sense kind of not an urban attitude, but an urban sensibility of time and place. And uh, and as I as I was trying to as I was fiddling with that, I, I um, I started to get a little, not really defensive, but wanting through the voice of a 16-year-old a, a to justify a different sense of time. And um, so that's, those are the selections that I, I picked uh, for this evening. So, <clears throat> um, I'm glad to see there are no kids. There are some swear words. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so in this in this part of the book, um, Ian's dog has has just arrived in his life. I thought I'd name him Hunter at first, since he knew how to take care of himself. But since he was eating mostly vegetables, he found on his own. Well, that's how I came to name him Gather. So something I have to say is about the word gather. It means a lot of things, like gathering food, gathering your thoughts. When somebody who listens, somebody like the sharp, when she asks you what it's like to grow up the way you're growing up, you gather together all these parts of your life and all these stories of things from way before, things that get mixed up with what's happening right then. Those stories don't come out like a goddamn timeline. They come out like compost. All the leaves, the coffee grounds, fireplace ashes, apple cores, tea bags, onion skins, eggshells, corn husks, potato peels, everything that turned to dirt at one time or another, doesn't matter when. It belongs with whatever you've got growing out of it right there in front of you. Doesn't matter either if you're talking about sugar snap peas, tomatoes, pumpkins, or weeds. You can't go pulling all the dirt away from the roots, trying to put it in some kind of order so you can understand it your way. You kill it if you do that. Stories we tell come out like the way you walk the woods if you want to know it. Zigzagging, doubling back, maybe tripling. Sometimes enough to find out that the parts you know the least about are the parts closest to home. You don't, make, you don't just make some frigging beeline to some hill like you're trying to get your steps in. I just don't understand people like that. I don't think they're from around here. But I feel like you need to understand this. Our stories from around here come out like the way you keep, we keep our work shed. You go in there, see what you have lying around, see some of it being old as hell, some of it being stuff you might even have had the money to buy for yourself. You move something, you find something else. You brush it off a little, then you use it or set it back down. But you need it all to piece together how things come to be the way they are now, how you come to be who you are. And when things go to hell in your own life, the word gather means something else all over again. Because there's a lot of good people, some who you know, some who you only just met. And the ones who matter, they listen. They gather on your side, and at least they try to help you, even if it might not work all, if it might not all work out. I know that for a fact. So we have sort of another, another perception of, of time that Ian shares after he's, um, sorry. <clears throat> after he's uh, had an initial interaction with, uh, with somebody who, well, I won't give anything away, but with, with, <laughs> with, uh, with some, an initial interaction that's kind of off-putting. 
One time when we were maybe six or seven, Drew and I were playing on the riverbank. The dads called us the four Ds, Danny, Dwight, Drew, and Dorian, even though I was already going by Ian, and Drew's name is Andrew. Anyway, our dads were fishing downstream from the bridge, casting to a deep pool on the other side. We were on the inside of the meander where anything that floats gets piled up. I saw what I took to be a big white rock I could just bring home since we had all these same rocks lining the garden where Graham always put red flowers, petunias or geraniums or something. Anyway, I went to pick it up because I thought Graham would be happy, but it turns out it wasn't a rock at all. It was styrofoam, stained rust brown in places, smoothed by the river, looked like a rock, but was light as a feather. It floated away when I put it in the water. I thought about that again when Mr. D was talking about density in eighth grade, about volume and weight and how, to, and how Two things measured the same can weigh up completely different. Time can be like that, too. Usually, just length is how people measure time, but it gets wide when what's happening includes someone or something far away, like your dad or your gram or some kid you knew who got taken away. And then it gets high up when what's happening hurts inside. That's when it gets big in every direction like a hot air balloon. You find yourself floating up, looking at everything from far away, almost empty, just like I was looking at myself and Peter and his family and all them logs and boards all over the mill yard. Like I was 200 feet in the air, a hot air balloon floating over a disaster scene. And let's see. Oh, I was gonna mark where I was gonna start reading this and I didn't. <laughs> We'll find it in a second. <laughs> so Ian's one of those kids who does not get great grades in school and doesn't particularly care. <clears throat> Me, I get my grades and I'm like, holy shit, I got a B. What the <laughs> hell did I get that in? I only get A's in PE, to be honest, sometimes in art. Water and the land, that's what I notice and could get an A in if anybody cared. Though I think about other things, maybe stuff you'd read about. I think about stuff while I'm standing, while I'm sitting and waiting for a deer, or for a ride, or whatever. Do you ever wonder about stuff like, if maybe one of them water, same water molecules that were in the river when Angel fell in, has done its thing all over the world, evaporated to a cloud, rained down, soaked into the ground, got sucked up by some pump into somebody's sink, sunk back down into the dirt, flowed into a spring, into a river, and out to sea, then steamed itself up into a cloud again. That whole water cycle thing is what I'm thinking about. I mean, do you ever wonder if some of them water molecules come back around to our same river more than once? If they have a memory of Angel falling in, right when they flow past that very same place again, all these years later? Seems bound to happen if you think about time. And I do think about shit like that. <laughs> So those are, those are some examples. Uh, I, as I was even looking for places where Ian talks about time, I was like, man, he does that everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, with, I, I've, the book had its kind of nascent way uh, in right around, um, around the year 2000, I was doing a, an oral history on the, uh, called a, To Watch a Beautiful Day Go, an oral history of hunting in the Norwich woods. And, um, what really struck me was I was in a camp, and uh, there were some 13 and 14-year-old boys, you know, usually pretty reticent, who were just actively partaking in all of these conversations, and uh, it was it was just so heartwarming to see. Um, and and some of the kids would say, you know, can you tell us the one about the you know whatever it was, and in that room, in that space. Stories from 50 and 60 years ago were current. They were present. They were at. They were happening at the same time. And so hunting is. Um, so much of hunting. What I was struck by is so much of hunting is really. It's. It's not about the meat they're going to put in their freezer. It's really about being out there, um, and it's about the stories they tell. My gramps now, he could tell some good stories. At least three years in a row, he and my dad brought me to deer camp where, once we got there, 
We did nothing but get out to the woods before sun, come back 9, 10 in the morning to warm up with coffee and pancakes, bacon, sausage, and stories, and go back out an hour or two before the sun dropped, maybe setting ourselves quietly along a deer run. Nights were more food, beer, or water, or whatever for the men not drinking, and more stories. Stories of hunts going back a hundred plus years. Stories people only remembered because they heard them being told, not because of being there. There might be talking everywhere. Somebody's loading the wood stove, somebody's cleaning a gun. A couple guys are looking at a topographic map. <coughs> might be a card game going on, but then you hear a story start and everybody stops and listens. Sometimes they'd let you have a try at telling your own. My third year, my third or so year at camp, I'm like, Gramps, can you tell the story about the guy trying to sneak up on the moose? Gramps says, well, that's a, be a story best told by Ansel. But it's Ansel's camp, and even though he wasn't with us during the days, on account of him driving around as a game warden, he'd come in after dark to be with us, then leave right after coffee in the morning. Anyway, Ansel, he says, why don't you tell us that story, Ian? Let's see how you do. <laughs> so I told him how this hunter's been tracking a moose, ginger stepping over twigs and through the understory all morning. He's got this vision of himself taking off his pack, setting up his rifle for the perfect shot, all quiet and patient once that moose finally stops to browse. And this hunter's thinking about moose sausage, steaks, burger, and stew, and he's planning on how to get the animal out of the woods, being that he's pretty far in. Well, imagine his surprise when he comes face to face with a big black bear, must be close to 400 pounds. <laughs> Bears, you probably know, hate two things, surprises and noise. And this black bear, he stands right up on his hind legs and damn, he is tall. The hunter, he turns to run, which you're not supposed to do. But it's not two big strides before he trips over a wood stove, random lion on its side, just <laughs> parked in the middle of the woods, halfway up a mountain in a white birch grove, miles from any camp even more miles from any road. The guy lands on a bunch of metal chimney pipes and they make such a racket, the bear, the racket, the bear bolts off and runs over a cliff. <laughs> Them pipes are all rusted to dirt now, but if you know where to go, you can still find that wood stove. They still call that place Stove Ledge. Anzel, he said I did all right, and everyone else was nodding, telling me storytelling must run in the family. It makes you feel like you belong. Mm -hmm. So, um, <clears throat> this, this, I think one of, one of the things I've been struck by is the book's been out now for like six weeks, I guess, um, is the, the focus has really been on poverty and, um, and addiction. And nothing that I picked tonight really um, I mean, it's, it's probably got a sensibility of, of, of poverty, but I wrote this as a story of resilience and, um, and where, where one particular kid takes solace. And, um, and, and, um, and what threatens that uh, so I'm, so this is a chapter called about poetry, uh, and and it's also about you know the hunter's way of life. And, um, in in Vermont is is uh, more threatened than it used to be. Uh, so I'll just read. <laughs> um, Gramps and Dad took me hunting. Okay, let's see. That's not going to be a good place to start. The Sugar Road is the kind of road you don't drive on unless you've got four-wheel drive on a vehicle with a body you don't care about and a paint job already gone to hell. <laughs> there are big, gnarly old maples up there, and in sugaring season, there's sap lines strung like spider webs every which way. And really deep into the woods are two stone foundations so old there's oaks 20 inches in diameter right inside the cellar holes. But it's the apple trees you care about, being as the deer go there to eat the fruit. There's acorns and beech nuts, too, like a supermarket for the herd. Gramps and Dad took me hunting there pretty much from the time I could walk until Gramps died. There's nothing better than prowling through the woods, 
looking for every little thing and just listening. You might hear a chickadee or a woodpecker or a red squirrel or spot a coyote or a gray fox. You're up there sitting so still waiting for a deer, you get a little weasel to run across your foot without even knowing you're there. And I can tell you, you feel like you belong. I know, because exactly that happened to me during bow season when I was maybe eight years old. Well, belonging is the whole point of this. A ways up the sugar road, somebody had posted all that land. Above them, beautiful stone walls lining the road are all these bright yellow posted signs telling us we can't go there anymore. It is just so wrong. I ended up buying four shirts at the thrift store, but my mind was all cloudy. Who's rich enough to buy hundreds of, acre, of acres of hardwood forest just so they can tell the rest of the world they're not allowed to hunt on land they've been walking forever? Police take notice. Our ways get forgot. So that's what's still on my mind the next day when Mr. Charpentier tells us to find a poem we like and write one like it. This is pretty much what I come up with. Kept out of the woods on a snowy evening. <laughs> <laughs> Whose woods these are has made it clear he does not want me hunting here. I wonder does he even know this stream, the trees, those rocks, these deer? The yellow signs give off their glow at every hundred feet or so. <clears throat> The posted land, it shuts me down, but I have no place else to go. I want to punch, I want to pound, I know this land for miles around. Over every hill, down every dell, I used to walk without a sound. But no one listens when I yell, although I have a story to tell, of a way of life I loved so well, a way of life I loved so well. Of course, I didn't want to hand it in. I mean, the words just slid out of my pencil, and I was just, I was even shaking a little bit. So the next class Charpentier hands them back, and his notes on mine say, You have a way with words, Ian. Strong writing. Know that poetry has the capacity to change the world. Also consider the use of the apostrophe in your over every hand line. <laughs> Think about how you would, could use an apostrophe to maintain the meter there. All I'm thinking, reading his comments, is that no way in goddamn hell am I writing over like I'm some old-fashioned dude writing back 200 years ago. <laughs> but he wrote some stuff, too, that I decided would make sense to change. So what you just read there, that's not my first try, to be honest. I don't keep old drafts and shit. <laughs> and then... It, all right, so I read Goodreads, and I like to see what people think of the book. Um, and one, one person, um, one comment was that the person wasn't sure that it, it moved fast enough for teenage readers. And, and uh, you know, my initial thought was, so what do you want? Do you know, do you want this to be a video game? So, when, if, if we need our kids to slow down a little bit, what should we do? You know, who's going to be part of the solution here? So, um, so having come up with that snappy comeback in my head, I was like, <laughs> so, ha. And, um, but this is a, you know, and I guess the proof that, or the hope that this will resonate with kids is that I've seen kids talk about this. These are the kids that I teach, and I hear them talk about this. And after, you know, I know that when I get back to school, after Thanksgiving break, I'm going to hear all the deer stories. I'm going to hear all the hunting stories. And it's, it's incredible to sit down and listen, because this is the stuff they pay attention to. So Ian's gone out with a, it's right after Thanksgiving, actually, and Ian's gone out with a, for a walk with his dog, Gather. So I'm set up in the woods on this log, and the air is as still as hell, and Gather's nosing around, crunching through the leaves, not finding much to eat, and I barely hear this tearing sound. I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from, and then I realize Gather, he's looking right at it. There's a huge frigging piece of bark that just at that moment is deciding it can't hang on anymore to its big dead elm. Hmm. Must be 12, 15 feet long, peeling back off and looping itself away from the trunk. We watch it drop, taking along a dozen rotted branches from a white pine and breaking up and folding on itself as it comes down. That's the thing. People are like, who cares? But you don't think about how this stuff ends up on the forest floor. Leaves, sure, that's obvious, especially in fall. 
But branches and bark and all that, you don't really think about it. Outside of a big windstorm, it's just plain unusual to see something big like that drop in the woods all by itself on a still day. Except it isn't all by itself. There's life going on between the bark and the dead trunk of the dead tree. When you really want to know the woods, you care about things like that. Gather thought so too, being as how once that bark hit the ground, he goes over and sniffs it. That's the kind of thing you tell most people they couldn't give a shit. But I could have told that to Gramps, or Ansel, or even Drew. And they would have known what I was getting at. It's rarer than seeing a shooting star. It's the difference between knowing about the woods and knowing the woods. That's what I think. So you can see I kind of arranged this so that I would start this way and then I would work my way back. I don't know. I thought it was pretty clever. So if you didn't catch that, I'll show you. <laughs> uh, so this is the last section that I, I, I wanted to read. Um, Ian's grandfather plays a huge role in his life, even though he's gone from it now. Uh, it's a voice he hears all the way through and, and is part of what supports him. <clears throat> I don't know how old I was, but I remember it like yesterday. I'm outside with my gramps at deer camp. The sun's been down one, two hours. We haven't had dinner yet. We're leaning back against this black F-250, probably got 20 inches of clearance under her, but it's the sky we're looking at. There's all these bunch November clouds with islands of open sky here and there where you can see crazy clear through to the brightest stars, the dull ones not being strong enough to fight the moonlight. Gramps, he's like, watch that hole in the clouds. It's going to track perfectly. Our hunter's moon will burst right through. I'm pretty much holding my breath, but the hole in the clouds, it misses the moon by a mile. Now you really feel like you do need to stay until you do see the moon even though you can hear raindrops hitting the trees that still have leaves on them, beeches and oaks mostly. A couple big drops, drips hit us. I shiver. Still, one of those gaps is bound to line up and show us that moon. Well, each hole le keeps looking like it's going to be the one. But then this other set of clouds slips in, or we just guess wrong. The gaps sail by, northwest to southeast. The best we get is clouds shining bright at the edges. So we're following this one hole for the 50th time. We're sure this is going to be the one. But what blasts across the hole is an orange meteor trailing sparks, like somebody just smacked a bright bed of coals in the sky. <laughs> Gramps, he just laughs and squeezes my shoulder. Well, Ian, he says, sometimes the closer you're paying attention, the more likely you are to be surprised. How will we tell the others about this when we go back in? We open the door to camp. The smell of stew is pouring out, and you can hear the clank of someone setting out the tin bowls. But you just never know what's coming next. We're right on the threshold, and the whole yard fills with moonlight. We turn around, and there it is, the big white moon glistening off every wet leaf and tree and truck in the yard. Our hunter's moon, Gramps says, lucky us. He lets me tell them about the meteor. Thanks. Yes. How did you find that shirt that matches your <laughs> <laughs> I actually did not realize the extent of it, but uh, that's Farmway Arbor Wear. Um, <laughs> Can I ask a question about deer hunting? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're so overpopulated with deer and people complain all the time they're eating all their gardens and stuff why don't we why isn't there a movement that has not yellow but some other green signs that say deer hunting and courage <laughs> yeah yeah i you know i i i think you should write a letter <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, deer have been something and uh, worse and um Worse in, in uh, the village, I think, even than out by, by our house. And for yeah. like 30, 20, 30 years ago, there were hunters all over the place, and mm. we just don't see any now. Yeah, well, they go, you know, they go looking for, I think, bigger, bigger tracts of land, and, and um, there's a lot of, and those are getting a little harder to find. Uh, Everything's yeah. posted. And the deer are smart. That's one thing that, uh, you know, that I, that I learned from interviewing hunters is, 
it's their turf, and they they uh, I think what they figured out is this is you know Norwich Village is a lot safer than up uh, Bragg Hill, and yeah. yeah. Uh, Karen. First of all, I'm almost done, and I just love this book. Oh, thank you. I hope I didn't give anything away. <laughs> uh, you didn't, actually. Um, and I love the details. Just the, oh, There's so many details in this book that I just feel like I could just, I want to read it again sometime. And I like that it goes slow, because it is just chock full of the stuff to look at. Oh, thank you. But that was my, my question. I don't know how to ask this question exactly, but, like, Ian is so... Ian, you know, and I, I'm just curious about like what the relationship is between you and Ian, or h how you. He's got this voice that that must live inside you for all these years that you wrote this book. I'm just curious how that works. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, it grew on me too, and when I was first writing it, uh, I started when about four months, um, almost to the day before we shut down for COVID. And, and, um, and so I would work on it weekends, sort of six hours on Saturday, six hours on Sunday, from very early in the morning until, um, like, until I was afraid that I was going to miss the dump or something. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so what I would do to make sure the voice stayed consistent was I would go up and, um, and for the minutes just read the very first opening lines uh, that were his and for maybe and I'd read them aloud and Pompey heard them but nobody else my dog Pompey. <laughs> yeah and and um, well there's uh, it's interesting one one of the and this is kind of an aside but it sort of relates is, is uh, I had anticipated a little bit of grief. Um, Ian has some Native American heritage, um, and the publishers actually wanted me to take that out. And they and the thing was, I really, as the as Ian's character became stronger and stronger. I was able to just sit behind his eyes and watch what was going on, and um, and it felt less and less like me. I mean, I wasn't channeling or anything like that, but it, but it felt less and less like me and more like the kids that I've been listening to, and um, and so I did. I backed out almost all of it, and and then one day I was talking to a student, and and um, it was. Well, I was talking to two students, and one of them happened to be wearing a kilt that day. And I said, oh, are you Scottish? And he said, yeah, Scottish and French Canadian. And the kid next to him, who I had just been thinking was, um, if somebody, if, if he liked to read at all, he would have been perfect for the audio book. Uh, <laughs> and he said, oh, that's me too. French Canadian, Scottish, and Native American. And I said, Seriously, I just couldn't believe it because that is exactly Ian and and uh, and he said, you know, and he said, Mr. Cotter, why are you so freaked out by this? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, just um, I said, I, I don't know because I, I didn't <laughs> tell him about the book and um, and then I said, so what? And this is how ignorant I am, you know, of I, what branch or, or tribe or nation or whatever. And he said, I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> and the whole thing with Ian is a big part of it was try, him trying, a big part of that I did take out was him trying to find out more from his grandmother um, what, what that part of his family, you know, what that heritage was. And, uh, and she wouldn't tell him. And I, part of the reason she wouldn't tell him was because I didn't feel like I knew enough to write that, but uh, and so you know that that stayed in there, but not, but I, I backed a, I backed a lot of it out, um, and it actually nobody's you know at this point you know nobody's it ha it hasn't been an issue anywhere, and and even since then I've um, 
I've talked to a number of students who know they have uh, Native American heritage, and just yesterday, I, yeah, yesterday was Thursday, um, I was talking to a, a kid who didn't know if it was Mohawk or Abenaki, but he knew he had Native American heritage. And, um, and I guess the other thing, you know, I'll just say is like a big, well, I'm going to share a little story if you don't mind, but, but uh, I was having a particularly difficult day. This was back when I was at Randolph, and, um, and I went into, I shut the door to my office, and I had a bathroom off my office, and, and I went into the bathroom, and I splashed my face with water, and the knock on the door, and, and one of the co-principals says, Ken, can you, John wasn't his name, but he was having a really hard day. Can you just calm him down? So I open the door. <laughs> my, my hair is wet. My face is wet. And I'm like, let's take a walk. That's what I said to, to John. And, um, and so we took a walk. And we walked. We left the building. We walked around the fields. And neither one of us talked for a while. And then we got to the back of Ayers Brook by, by, uh, by, that surrounds the Randolph campus. And, and finally, he told me how much he hated his dad. And, um, and we, so we sat down. And he just said he, he, wants, he wants to bail his family out. And then we got back in. I was like, hey, you think you're ready to go back for class? And it was probably an hour. And, uh, and he said, yeah. And then the co-principal said, hey, you're, so you're the, you're the John Whisperer. What did you say? And I said, I didn't say anything. I was just listening. And I think that's what they're just, you know, so many kids are just so desperate for. So, so it was a lot of listening that turned into to Ian. No particular kid, but. Yes, Sharon. Well, what I wanted to say, or what I, what I felt reading it, and I'm within maybe an hour of finishing it. Yeah. Um, is that I grew up. I just called you Sharon, and I know yeah. that you're Tracy. I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah. Um, I grew up with Ian. He was my friend, my neighbor, my hmm. classmate my first boyfriend, my second boyfriend. <laughs> I knew a lot of Ian's growing up in the Upper Valley uh, a long time ago. And yet still, and I've, I've, like you, listened to and worked with a lot of Ian's and a lot of their female and now gender neutral counterparts. And um, I just am so moved and often to tears by, as I'm reading, by how you have given him and them a voice. Thank you. Yeah, it's just, it's just extraordinary. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Joanna. And Ken, you did that in a believable voice, a real authentic voice, but you made lyrical poetry of it at the same time. And it wove together perfectly. I was in awe oh. that those two things could coexist. <laughs> and I'm glad you got it through the New York publishers who sometimes <laughs> really don't get it. That must have taken walking around the field with them. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I did have, I did have uh, one of the copy editors wrote and said, Ken, it's, you know, late November. Uh, the leaves don't have any trees on them. And, uh, and I wrote back and I said, beeches and oaks. And then I went out with my phone <laughs> and I took, like, 5,000 pictures of be beaches and oaks that still had a lot of brown and yellow leaves on them and, and sent them back to me. <laughs> Actually, were you in New York or was it Candlewick? It's Boston. Candlewick, yeah. Out of, it's Boston. Yeah, it's Boston, yeah. 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 A little better. <laughs> <laughs> Candlewick has a very strong Vermont presence, too, which is really wonderful. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kathy. So to, to follow up on Karen's question, um, about 
you know, you're, you, you have incredible observational skills. I mean, he's talking about the observations like the, the Jeff just wrote me, read me this morning, the, the, the part of um, the, the bark falling off the tree. Mm -hmm. And do you recall when you were that age paying attention and noticing that? Yeah. Um, we moved, I was a little, in a way, uh, I didn't think of it at the time that way, because I had, we moved from Poughkeepsie, New York, and our house backed up to 100 acres of old growth forest. It was just an incredible place to grow up. And we moved to Rhode Island where I didn't know anybody and didn't really relate to most of my class. And um, I spent a heck of a lot of time, I feel like the woods was my therapist. Uh, and I would go and make, you know, the kind of odd for a 15 year old maybe, but make, you know, rafts and things on this little stream that flowed through the woods along these mossy banks and, and uh, just, I knew where the, um, oh boy, the lady slippers would come up and the, the bones, Bonaset or, and, or whatever, the, and Joe Pieweed, I knew where all of that stuff was going to come up and, uh, and it was really, I didn't get to know the folks too well in that part. We moved, uh, we were only there for maybe four years, but, um, but I got to know the woods. Yeah. Lucky me. <laughs> yes. Ooh, hi. Um, so I, I'm an, I was here the day your book came out, and I bought a copy of it, like six weeks ago. Oh, and I have not read it, like all these other lovely people, because I teach English. And so I read nothing. <laughs> at, at, a, at a high school. At a high school. Um, and I actually really appreciate what you said about this, the sacredness of storytelling and the storytelling culture. And I'm so glad that you kept the indigenous oh. piece. Mm -hmm. And I think the fact that you embedded with that the mystery of the kids and the, and their, the origin of their Native American, because that is validating oh. of what we've done. Mm -hmm. And I just mm -hmm. finished teaching an, in an indigenous mythology unit. I just taught, I just finished teaching Ceremony. Oh, yes. By Leslie Marmon Silko. Yes. Which I cannot more highly recommend. It's it was found and mm -hmm. life changing. You know, just, it was amazing. Mm -hmm. And my students loved it. And I loved it. And mm -hmm. it was just a really powerful experience. And it, like, I want to go home tonight and start reading your book. Because I, and I, I, feel, I feel like it's just going to be. Right. Like, so thank you for oh. writing the book you did. And thank you for maintaining, you know, for holding course on uh, the, you know, pieces even. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Hi, Holly. How are you? Good. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, this is incredible work connecting to this generation that you've done, but I really appreciate the uh, savoring of a disappearing Vermont, and um, that's really important to me. I have recently joined the Corinth Select Board, uh -huh. and I'm feeling real time as people who are large landowners shut off their land and mm. want public roads thrown up and trails closed. This tension within the town of our our collective land versus mine and theirs, mm. and um, so the um, resiliency with which. Uh, Ian embraces his environment is just beautiful and uh, part of another Vermont that I hope we don't lose. So mm. this helps enshrine it. And I really appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Well, we didn't get a chance to say enough nice things about Ken at the beginning, but we, we won't belabor the point now. But I want to thank. <laughs> First, first of all, thank all of you for coming out tonight, and I want to thank Ken Caddo for being with us this evening, mm -hmm. and for all that he does in this community, and for writing this beautiful book. Mm -hmm. Many of you have it already. If you don't, tonight is a great opportunity to get it. <laughs> um, folks, Gather was recently nominated. In fact, on the day it came out, it was announced that it was nominated as a, 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 a nominee for the National Book Award in Young People's Literature. And just a couple of weeks ago, it made the shortlist. This book is a finalist 
for that incredibly important award. Um, so a little a little piece of Vermont going out to this big global stage. We here at the Norwich Bookstore are, are incredibly proud of Ken. We're incredibly proud of this book. And thank you to all of you for being a part of it. And thank you again, Ken, for sharing it with us. Let's give him a big round of applause. Yeah, thank you.